Hi there, welcome back and thanks for rejoining me for part two of this video series. If you haven't already seen part one, I recommend that you view it. The link is in the content description. Uh, and for that, if you haven't seen the other video as well, I'm Anna Pirelli, the business owner. This particular video is going to focus on increasing personal power and maximizing potential through the use of numbers. And we're going to link it together using what we know from the public domain about Prince Andrew. Now, as usual, before we do that, just in case this is your first viewing, I must outline the following disclaimer. So before we talk about numerology or astrology and what they can show us about our pathway, I'm putting in this reminder of free will. Um, and this is our freedom to choose within all situations. Now, of course, there are going to be limitations upon our freedom of expression um, and what we show the world. And this usually depends on the country and the culture of the land in which we live um, and the laws of the land. But equally, even within our home unit, we may have uh, people that have a domineering or overpower, overpowering personality that influences the way the entire family expresses itself. But whatever is happening, no one can control what's going on inside of ourselves and our inner self. No one can control our thoughts and emotions. Now, in regard to having people that are domineering and controlling, the other thing is we all experience karma. And if the only karma that we have is the cons consequences to our actions on the earth plane, well, it's more than that, okay? So people that seek to dominate other people's freedom of outward ex expression are creating karma for themselves. And if it's blocking others from achieving their higher pr potential, it actually creates some fairly serious karma for them. And the reminder here is sometimes karma occurs at a soul level. And to an extent, this offers an explanation about why victims of injustice may feel that they don't see justice occur on the earthly life. My understanding is that we should all rest assured that if a karmic debt is created on this earth plane, it will be addressed in future lives and that nobody escapes it. At some point in time, I'll do a video um, specifically related to karma and explaining what it is and karmic debt. So going back to free will, for those people that lack the capacity to self-reflect, an initial numerology report might be perceived as a little bit brutal because life is not all sunshine and roses and the pathway for all of us includes challenges, tests, trials as part of our soul evolution. Now, let's not forget that life is full of dualities and opposing forces, and this is the same for numerology. It will highlight the good and the bad and what might be perceived as ugly, and this is where free will is important, because when we make our choices, we can override what is ugly, or we can take what we think is ugly, and we can make it something far more beautiful. Um, we make a choice of whether we create from what we're given, that old make lemons, get lemons and make lemonade or whatever that saying is we get what we're given and we create something from it and just a reminder to some people would prefer to sit with their current lack of comfort or unhappy circumstances because they fear entering into a space of uncertainty or taking risks now that's okay for them it might be part of their pathway it's not for us to judge them numerology definitely does show personality types who will struggle with change and they don't cope with it. They actually need the stability of this discomfort or lack of comfort and the routine as part of them feeling safe and reaching their potential in other ways. So each to their own. And the other thing, when we talk about free will, there are those that will exert their free will in a way that is a steadfast refusal to develop, evolve and change. These are the ones that I find a little bit disturbing myself. Life is not a fatalistic experience of here it is and go suck it up. And I'm sure at some point in time when we've been, and you too, that when attempting to negotiate a conflict or a communication breakdown, somebody, usually someone who's quite domineering or has just been called to account for insensitive, potentially even cruel actions, will turn around as a defence and say, well, this is who I am, go deal with it or I've always been this way, you knew it when we met me, right? I believe that when they're making these statements, they're not making 
powerful choices. They're actually not even being a powerful person. Um, they're taking the easy route and refusing to change and adapt and evolve. And in fact, what we are seeing is the misuse of power as opposed to being a powerful person because they're using their power to attempt to control another person or even emotionally manipulate them. And it's not going to work for the long time, long term rather, because if a person plateaus in their development and refuses to grow and evolve, ultimately those people that are around them, they're on their path of evolution as well. And they quite likely will outgrow them and feel compelled as part of their own inner journey to move on and leave them behind as part of reaching their own soul potential. So while stepping into personal power includes an acceptance of self and personal limitations, it also involves a willingness to evolve and grow and develop. Being our authentic selves doesn't require justification, um, defense or explanation. Now think about that in relation to the previous slide. It also doesn't accept excuses. So when a person says, this is what I am, it becomes an excuse for poor behavior usually, right? Now, all behavior and actions carry karma, desirable or undesirable. If we are actively working toward our purpose and our best expression, quotation marks, and reaching our potential, then as part of the life journey, we're going to realize that we made some mistakes or some erroneous decisions. Um, especially when we deviate from our internal guidance. Now, in the best of circum circumstances, if our intention is pure, make no mistake, you can have good intention, but there is a truth to the saying, the paths to hell are paved with good intention, right? All actions are going to create karma. And just because we didn't deliberately harm or hurt a person doesn't make us devoid from karma. It does, however, help us to forgive ourselves for our failings and to accept our consequences with a strength of character. It also does allow us an opportunity to um, make good. You know, if you've done the wrong thing, I'm trying to think of the word, to not compensate because some things you can't compensate for, but at the very least, you can give a person an apology and try and make good. Uh, we all know the saying anyway, that you can break the plate, you can glue it back together. The cracks are there, but it still functions, but it's never quite the same, right? So as far as defense goes, well, if we've got to go, if what we've done breaches a law of the land, well, of course, we're going to have to go into the court system and defend our actions for what we've done. If our actions aren't unlawful though, and we're attempting to justify and explain to other people, it's usually because we want their approval. And sometimes, you know, because nothing is truly black and white, sometimes this is valid. If there's been a misunderstanding that's resulted in harsh judgments and parties are willing to find a solution, um, then this is a good thing. You do need to explain, or we all need to explain from where we sit, why we did what we did, and this builds empathy and understanding a lot of the time, but it also gives people an opportunity to make informed decisions about their next processes and stages and what they're going to do with the information. It might mean that they're going to move on, um, but it can be a parting of the ways that is amicable without all the nasty acrimony. Other times, the worst thing that we could do is attempt to explain and justify to people that we don't know um, because it can really be backhanded. And this actually explains the wisdom of the British royal family of they never complain and never explain. And all we have to do is watch the news at the moment. Prince Harry has shown us what happens when a person complains. There is always people that are worse off who feel insulted that uh, someone is complaining and perceive them to be ungrateful because they're actually very privileged. So there's that never complain stuff. Prince Andrew has demonstrated why a person should not attempt to justify or explain their actions. And we're going to look at him specifically in a moment and his birth charts and numerology, right? When a person attempts to explain and justify to people who are unwilling to extend compassion or har judging them very harshly, all that happens is they're further scrutinised. People will hear the words that are both said and unsaid, and not only will they be listening to the words, they'll be watching the non-verbal body language and the non 
verbal actually conveys volumes of information that even if somebody is not aware of what body language is or not a professional body language interpreter, they're going to pick up on signals and their little stomachs are going to be responding to that. And the other thing is that it can all be misinterpreted by the listener or viewer. Now, what I loved watching was when Prince Andrew attempted to justify what happened in regard to the allegations against him. When he had the interview, he handed his power over to a, pu a global public who condemned him as a man and a prince. Now, remember, the Queen told him not to do the interview, but he just didn't listen. And I just want to clarify here that I'm not defending him here at all. And it's only in more recent years that I've begun observing observing the British royal family and that's because of my interest in numerology and I've made some interesting observations here and because of the saturation on social media. Now if people are paying close attention to the members um, that I've already mentioned they are living walking examples of what we really sh would be very unwise to do. Lessons learned, wisdom and accumulation can be gathered from observing other people's experiences. I suggest you watch, all right? We're going to talk about this real soon. So when we talk about numerology, most people will think, if they think anything at all about it, is that we're referring to the ruling number and that this is all they need to know. However, this is absolutely not correct. The ruling number refers to the primary pathway through life. Um, that is what we call the individual or the person's life path in a very generalist way. So numerology offers so much more than this, but for the purposes of demonstrating what the ruling number and day number looks like, let's take a look at this birth date here on the screen. Um, and let's start with the day number. The day number is the sum of the numbers of the day a person was born, for instance, here we have the 23. To calculate the day number, we add the 2 plus the 3 together and we come up with the number 5. So the person's day number on this birth date is a number 5. Now just a note here, we can make 5 with different number combinations such as a 1 plus 4 and that pathway will vary from the 2 plus 3. So Based on my observations, a person with, um, and I call it a 23.5, this is how I work it out. So if I, I'll just jump ahead for a moment, say the day number for this person is a 23.5 and their ruling number is a 35.8, all right? So what I've observed for people with 23.5 is that they have tendencies to be workaholics. Now in the Western world, or rather in Australia, I tend to see it manifest with men who are very high performing in their jobs, quite often their management, and they have an attitude of work hard, play hard. So within the Australian context, this translates to they'll often work very long hours to a high standard. And as soon as the day, the work day is finished, they rush home and they do what we call crack a tinny or open a can of beer as part of unwinding and this becomes part of their pattern. Women might also crack a tinny or they might get a bottle of wine or a cask of wine and just have a couple of glasses to unwind before they go to bed. Then their pattern tends to include that they will drag themselves out of bed in the morning smacking the alarm a few times before they get up. Then they will rely on coffee, caffeine to get going for the day and then they're, when they're at work they'll have multiple cups of coffee as part of keeping their brain alert and then they get home from work and they do the process again. So the advice from a numero numerological perspective here would be to find different ways to unwind instead of relying on alcohol because obviously if they drink excessively there's a risk of developing alcohol dependency and this will in turn impact negatively on their biology and potentially their relationships if they don't get a grip on it. Now, just a reminder here as well, that just because a person has a 23.5 ruling number or day number, this doesn't mean that they will automatically behave in the ways that I've described. It simply outlines a vulnerability or an area for improvement. So other people can be workaholics without relying on, on the alcohol or substances because we're all individuals and culture and country will influence how a person with this kind of worth ethic ethic manages their stress levels. So back to the ruling number. To calculate the ruling number or what we refer to as the primary pathway, we add the sum of the birth numbers together. This includes the day numbers. So in this instance, we add two plus three plus seven plus one plus nine plus nine plus four equals 35. We then bring all the numbers down to the singular number. So we would add the 35 together, three plus five equals eight. 
Therefore, this person's ruling number is a 35 slash 8. Um, now, bearing in mind, the 35-8 is going to have a different pathway outlined to somebody who is a 17-8, which is the 1 plus 7 equals 8, or a 25-8, which is a 2 plus 5, and a 4 plus 4, which is a 44-8. Right? The way a single number is calculated speaks directly to the influences of the primary path. Now, in my experiences, people with a 35-8... Um, as a ruling or day number, they tend to be very good at manifesting and particularly when it comes to financial abundance, which is no surprise really because the number eight is a power number. Uh, in fact, actually, it's a, I'm not even sure that I could explain what an eight is within this context, but eight comes as a power. Um, these people are not afraid to work for their goals and they definitely enjoy the fruits of their labor so most of the time i see this combination where the people might have extensive real estate portfolios for example they don't tend to be showy with their money they're not corporation um, owners i don't generally see them in corporate management i see them as successful business owners um, they usually live fairly well and if you go to visit them you'll be thinking oh they've got a nice house with the mod cons and all the toys that a person would like but you wouldn't look at them and think this automatic wow they must be rich you would look at them and think well they seem to be doing okay and then you might find out down the track in casual conversation that they own a house here or there as a rental property and after multiple conversations then you work out they have actually really quite an extensive real estate portfolio that actually applies to the person with the 23 as well interestingly i just realized that as i said it so what i infer from this if i can talk what i infer from this specific birth date is that the person has all of the makings for a total imbalance in their life or work very little time for play or self-care because they are so focused on the work now they will usually love what they do too so while the attributes of the personal path is one of power as i said with the ruling eight this could be undermined by the day number with the overworking however we can't read a birth date or the numerology as simply as this there are other aspects to consider such as the person's astro their gender the country that they live in the culture and so forth and often what we see in a birth date that is a vulnerability is compensated for in other areas of the numerology report across the birth chart so before i go on to the next slides just to let you know i will be going to create um i will be going to great english there i will be making um specific videos dedicated to the aspects of the birth charts the pyramids and the functions of the numbers so stay tuned for those so the significance of numerology when we break it down properly is as pointed out in the previous slide it can identify a person's vulnerabilities and it helps them to build their strengths now i do recall in the writing of david phillips where he made a comment that he believed that people should be exposed to the numerology reports in their teenage years before they leave school now the problems that i see with that approach within the australian context again is teachers are now over tasked and working outside of their professional parameters as part of what they call early intervention and prevention of behavioural disorders. And as a S word, intervention, um, addressing teenage and youth S problems. Now, this is a great idea from where I sit in a theoretical perspective, because I'm all about early intervention and prevention. But from a practical perspective, I believe it translates to quite harmful practice towards young children by othering them and making them feel abnormal while supposedly building them up. Now, while teachers do study and can upskill in regard to children's behavioural uh, interpretations, I see it as an overreach um, where the teachers are making decisions that are not necessarily good ones. But anyway, moving on from this, if numerology was applied to a classroom context, I do believe that we would also experience problems there with um, people talking about numerology without remembering to tell the person that these potential negative traits are quite simply vulnerabilities and they can be surmounted through the use of self-discipline and mastering their internal desires and embracing a, a concern for all people. So 
what I can say is that although it's definitely beneficial for all people to have a numerologist, one who genuinely understands numbers and the influences to do a report for them, I just want to clarify here, I'm not trying to flog my business. If I suddenly get inundated with requests from people to do a numerology report, um, just a reminder, it's just little old me. It's not a computer. All of the reports I do are personalised and I don't think that I could survive with being in, inundated. Anyway, back to knowing the numbers. I do believe that the way numerology could be used in a formal setting is by qualified counsellors perhaps who have an understanding both of mental health as um an area of expertise and even parental um, strategies and this is because I've worked in the field of mental health and I've tested my theories that I have on certain numbers and their links with mental health and I identified that some numbers show a predisposition to what is called a mental breakdown um, even addiction and even schizophrenia. And one of my colleagues at work suggested that I test my theories because we were working in a clinical residential setting. And um, anyway, so I did. I did the, I got the birth dates of all the residents and I calculated them out and I found that there was a lot of the same numbers in there um, represented with, yeah, um, all sorts of terrible clinical mental health conditions. So... Perhaps, um, I'll just pause this while I have a think about my next words. Perhaps a better approach might be that if we were working with families as a unit, because if we were giving um, an adult or a parent the content of their own numerology chart, they will see their strengths and vulnerabilities as well, and they can work towards empowering themselves, and that will flow down to their capacity to be a better parent for their child because they can then look at their child's charts and see what their child's vulnerabilities are and be able to help build the strengths of their child. That might be a better solution. So in the previous slides, I have referred to topics such as birth charts and pyramids, and these are highly important as far as identifying the personal traits and the challenges that a person might face as they walk their path. So for expediency, I'm not going to look at the pyramids here, but rather explain that when we do look at them, they will demonstrate and identify certain peak life phases and what a person can achieve at certain times and ages in their life. So in some way, they are a bit predictive. Um, anyway, the peaks can be identified through a different way of calculating the person's birthday and each peak speaks to a different numerological value between 1 and 11, which is master numbers. Hopefully that's not too confusing for you. You might need to ro um, rewind and play it again. Right, anyway, the birth chart is particularly important because it demonstrates the personality traits and any potential gaps and challenges because as you look at this image here, you can see it's separated into three layers. It's mind, body and spirit. And when we calculate out the birth chart, we of course fill that all those empty spaces with numbers. Now, nobody is going to have all of the squares filled, right? Um, but what the chart can do is, for example, if we look at this particular chart here, it shows you imbalances. So we can see this birth chart the person is not really a thinker, they're very much a feeler. Um, they would be acting on their gut instinct a lot of the time and they're probably less of a walker, just looking at that. They're probably less likely to get up and actually action the things that they feel should be done. Now, the other benefits of the birth chart is actually these arrows and I haven't put on here the content. I will be doing separate videos on the birth chart and the arrows speaking specifically to them because they're actually quite revealing as well and everything that shows up on the birth chart comes through with guidance and advice on how to navigate these challenges now some people may have seen the birth chart and thought it was a standalone numerology tool absolutely not um, but it is referred to as tic-tac-toe by certain people so just a reminder that the birth chart 
represents aspects of an individual and it's not the whole picture of influence on a person. The person is also influenced by their astrology, where their planets sit and in which houses at the time of their birth and more importantly where their sun and moon signs are. Other influences that speak to a person's past life or previous lives is through astrology once again and understanding the north node now just another interesting point for the skeptics is that in my observations families can experience recurring and repetition of birth numbers and that simply reinforces my belief in divine plans and soul packs um, and i have uploaded a video on the divine plan that you might be interested in watching um, i won't be explaining it in this video but a good numerology plan can i identify past life karma too and what the karmic pathway is but only when the birth time is provided um, other influences include name neuro numerology god i can't talk today because each letter of the alphabet has a numerological value and it carries a vibration so let's take a look at how this translates in a very summarized overview by looking at prince andrew and what we know about him that's in the public forum i'm not going to include in my interpretations of the number any speculative type gossip allegations so before we look at andrew's numerology let's take a look at where his life is currently at because i imagine he's sitting at home questioning himself where it, where did his life go so wrong um, most people will think that he hasn't lost everything, but I do believe from his perspective he would think that he has lost it all because he can no longer represent the crown, he can't wear his military uniforms, he's no longer able to wear those special robes, which I can't remember what they're called. He's unable, unable to generate the income to support his previous lifestyle and I think most people would agree that um, he certainly had some questionable associations and friendships that have reflected badly upon him. The loss of status will be a very big deal to him. So we know that um, historically he's associated with people that we now know to be sexual predators, such as Epstein and Maxwell, and even Jimmy Savile. And we also know that back in the day, he was certainly considered to be a Prince Charming. He was desirable by most women, and he was considered a bit of a hooray Henry. He loved a good party when he was younger. He was good times, all about fun and good times. He married a woman who was an extrovert, and he was known, I not sure that he was known after the marriage but certainly before he was known to enjoy the company of adult women and this has been reinforced um, over the more recent years by whistleblowers and leakers now i don't think that he would deny any of this because there's no harm to his image or a man's image by being popular with the ladies as they say um, did I say that he was a war hero because obviously he was considered to be one and clearly he was born into extreme privilege and financial abundance and he never ever had to worry about money. His mother held the honeypot and if he got into problems he could always rely on her to bail him out financially and this includes her gifting him a multi-million dollar, well pound, property as a wedding gift. And we know that through his privileged position, he was socially connected to some of the, well, if not all of the most powerful people around the globe for one reason or another. Andrew most definitely had it all and more. What went wrong? Well, probably the first thing is he didn't get a numerology chart done. Everything that has gone wrong in his life could have been avoided with a little bit of self-awareness. But to be honest, and here's a spoiler alert for you, even if he had seen his report, he probably would not have listened to it anyway or taken it seriously. And I say this based on his birth date and ruling number combined with his astrology. I think it's very important to look at the timeline of some of his questionable decision making because life is a series and process of growth and maturing for all of us and Andrew is no different. As a young person, he certainly lived that footloose and fancy free lifestyle, was no doubt all fun and games at the time. Um, and we can understand his desire to be associated with exciting people, regardless of where a pos or the position a person is born in. Most of us like to be around people that are funny and good fun to be with. I imagine that most people will assume that Andrew's fall from grace occurred with the allegations by Victoria Whatsaface. I can't remember her surname and I certainly can't pronounce it. But either way, I would disagree. Disagree. I would say that it started 
at the time that he let the house gifted to him by his mother fall into disarray. Even with the breakdown of his marriage, he retained public sympathy because Fergie was considered to be the disloyal party, obviously caught with compromising photographs. So although many people at the time speculated that Andrew was probably playing around and playing the field, within the marriage, at the end of the day, he still had public sympathy. In 2008, it became known, this is where it became more serious, it became publicly known that he had associated with the pedophile father, Kevin Gleed, who had been a mentor to him when he was away at school. Long story short, there are sectors of the community who do believe that Andrew must have known about his activities. I'm not one of them. Um, I'm not saying that he did or he didn't. I'm saying that I've known plenty of people who have later found out that someone they loved or adored was a pedophile and that the experience was completely confronting for them. And just because you know or knew a person and later found out they were a pedophile doesn't make you one of them. Um, anyway, he was able to ride through these tensions and this tense time by applying the rationale of the Queen, which was no complaining and no explaining. Good, good advice there. Then again, four years later, 2012, Jimmy Savile, oh my God, um, a notorious and criminal pedophile with links to the royal family was exposed, if you like. Now, of course, Prince Andrew is in the royal family, so he was connected to this show, if you like, of exposure. And, and these exposures reverberated very badly, and I actually believe unfairly, on all the members of the royal family. Jimmy managed to fool everybody he associated with, including investigative journalists, um, and people that had known him for decades were not aware that he was a master of disguise. The only people that were exposed to that horrendous side were actually his victims, who were all children. Um, and don't forget that I don't blame the royal family for being sucked in by this because Savile had that public persona of being lovable and affable and good fun to be around and with a personality that was larger than life that had a great heart, remember. You know, I mean, I never knew much about him when he was alive. I've learned more about him when he was dead because I'm not um, English, I live in Australia. But what I can see is it's understandable that the royal family, based on their roles, would wish to be associated with a person of his persona with integrity, usually. Um, I question, if anything, why their advisors actually didn't do their homework. Um, we could go down a rabbit warren with this, but uh, anyway, apparently the Royal Family Association goes back to 1989. And if we look at things in perspective there, then we could say, well, they weren't good years for the Royal Family. They were particularly difficult. So they may have um, deviated for, from their good common sense, for want of a better word. But once again, the way the royal family dealt with this, including Prince Andrew, was never complain and never explain. Go back to the rationale we used before that, you know, you, you don't complain and justify. So they wore out, if you like, they took the approach of um, just wearing the taint. It was like a black cloud over them. And because they followed the rationale that they did, um, the memories or the public judgment seem to dissipate, dissipate a bit. Now, we've got to do a little jump backwards here um, because it was in 1999, apparently, that he was introduced to Jeffrey Epstein via Maxwell. And it was allegedly 2001. I say allegedly, we've got to use all these words. So uh, Victoria alleged that in 2001, um, she was sexually assaulted by Prince Andrew. Um, now, this is where it gets a little complex, I believe. I haven't been able to see any reports saying that he was violent or anything like that. So I'm just going to narrow this down to what I think is the issue. Andrew becomes embroiled in allegations against Jeffrey Epstein in regard to the sex trafficking. And he's named as one of the people, if you like, um, witnesses to events and that Victoria was paid to have sex with him. All right. Her statement is that she was forced to have sex with Andrew, but the statement does not say who she was forced by and whether Andrew was aware that she did not want to have sex with him, um, or even if he was aware that she was being trafficked. So the questions that the US courts want to know, and this is in 2021, is was he aware that she was underage? Was he aware that she was a prostitute? Was he aware that, he, um, that she was being trafficked? Um, 
Now, complicating these problems is that in the UK, a girl of the age of 17 is considered to be the legal age of consent, whereas it's not the case in the US. Um, he also was an English citizen and the alleged offence occurred on British soil. So the thing is, it's questionable about whether or not there was a criminal act, certainly unsavoury. Um, but even still, at this point in time, I do believe that the English people would have given him the benefit of the doubt, even if they had adopted the attitude of there's no smoke without fire, because, you know, we would see the royal family as a potential target for unscrupulous young ladies. And as far as public opinion goes, even the very fact that um, his mother paid Victoria out, the British citizen would still be able to um, manage that with her own sense of morality, saying, oh, well, you know, he's done it because his mum is really old and it's coming up to her 70-year celebration and, you know, nobody wants to put that on their old mother at this particular time. So he still had public sympathy, I believe, there, right up until he did the interview on the TV. Now, it was the interview, I believe, that was his downfall because it was absolutely cringeworthy and he had been advised by the Queen not to do it and he refused to take her advice. And basically what he did was he was caught out lying in a public forum. Oh my God, I couldn't even watch all of it. Um, and that interview is going to remain there for posterity. Now, I can speculate over his motivations for lying because when a person lies, they're trying to protect either themselves or someone else. Now, in his instance, and based on his numerology, there are definitely some unsavoury characteristics that he probably would have preferred to not have disclosed for any number of reasons. I can also speculate on what those might be. Um, but even still, I'm not con convinced that his behaviours were criminal, but rather the predictable behaviours associated with his numerology and his astrology and that the fall from grace could have been avoided for him. And just to be clear, I want to say here, I'm not trying to paint the picture here that he is a nice guy that we all want to invite over for dinner. What I'm aiming to do is show how numerology offers insight and some explanation for people's motivations. And this is all part of developing understanding and compassion in the spirit of brother, brother and sisterhood. So when we look at his motivation as to why he's done what he's done in his choices, this is actually quite a long one and I apologise for it and I'll try not to stumble over my words, okay? So in the first instance, let's take a look at his astrology. He's an Aquarius, um, that's his sun sign and this is basically the outward aspect of himself that he shows the world. We might not all see it, by the way. Aquarians tend to be thinkers and they have a complex life path and when living positively, their role includes, and in fact, it's an internal desire, it's more than a role. There's this whole inner yearning to uplift humanity. But at the same time, they can be quite opinionated um, as well because they think they're right. It's not normally a big problem except for when they're living negatively because the way this translates is that they think they know everything, they can't be told anything, and once they've made their mind up, it is shut, right, until the universe will force them to open again. There is associated with this negative Aquarian um, a sense of superiority, they think they're better than others, and they can be very judgmental uh, to others based on my observations, of course. Now, in essence, what we're talking about is ego with capital letters. So the astrological influences here show that Andrew has been very egotistical and superior in the way he relates to others. Now, in fairness, though, while his astrology does lend itself to where this is the way that he learns, well, he can only really learn this way. This is what is showing in the astrology and the numerology. He potentially struggles to process lessons or directions that are given to him. And he needs to learn himself from the harsh life experiences. And perhaps being privileged was a catch-22 for him when he was younger because he wasn't given the opportunities to learn from his experiences, which is the only way he can learn because others were covering and fixing everything for him. So this kind of compounded the arrogance and superiority, which then lends itself to a lack of self-awareness and even um, an incapacity to know his vulnerabilities or limitations. And we're talking purely here on his astro. 
So let's now take a look at his ruling and day numbers. His ruling number or the primary path is that of the 2810, which is actually a very dynamic, positive and energetic number that carries the energy of the master of your own destiny. So if any of us were in doubt about who was in control here, especially in regard to his downfall, um, it was all of his own making. It's here in his numbers. He is capable though. So the swing part of this is he is capable of truly great achievements still if he chooses to follow the advice given in his charts. The advice is, the first caution is that he should regulate poor and impulsive behaviours because a lack of judgement, especially around who he associates with, might result in him losing everything he's worked for. Dong Dong, I would imagine at this point in time, he certainly believes so. The energy of the number, however, conveys that he does have the strength and courage combined with the willpower um, and initiative to start over again as a much wiser and more practical human being. And as he rebuilds his life, he should be very mindful to avoid dominating others and to steer clear of all forms of superficiality and focus instead on pursuits of spiritual substance. He has got inherent tendencies for procrastination. Um, this is highlighted by the numerology. And so the advice is that he should avoid putting things off as it will only breed laziness within him. And that will be counterproductive because it will deplete his self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, what else? Meditation will help him to retain a balance across his mind, body and spirit or the work-life balance and to sustain and build on his strength while maintaining internal harmony. And this in turn will support his capacity to be selective, to use his discernment and to discriminate about what is important and what isn't. And just a little tip from me here, if the reports are to be believed that he was paying 10,000 a month to a rugu, we call them, for a few months a year to help him learn how to meditate, well, that was money that was not well spent. I'd say that was wasteful stuff. Um, he would have been better off getting a few guided meditation scripts, if nothing else, and learning to focus on breathing while playing relax relaxation music. Just my thoughts. Okay, his day number of a 10 refers to his social circle, where he, this is what he was born in with, and we can see this based on the previous slide. This is there, it's in his numbers. He has an abundance of acquaintances and a tendency to focus on physical gratification and that will incur negative karma and further questionable friendships. Gosh, gee, could we be talking about Maxwell and Epstein? The advice for this was to avoid superficial activities and people. Is this ringing bells, folks? He could have done with this advice probably about 1985, but the reality is he wouldn't have listened to anyway, remember, because he knows everything. This day number is associated with being very extravagant with time and money and carries a warning that if you're waste, wasteful, it will result in the loss of physical abundance. And this is exactly what happened to the house that his mum bought him. So now let's take a look at the name numerology. I've done the two names um, for Andy and Andrew, and I haven't looked at the, or I'm not going to discuss the inner or soul urge. I'm going to talk only about the outer, which is refers to the aspects that he shows to the world. Now, if he chooses to go by the name Andy, once again, he's not going to take advice because of this, you know, it reinforces that I'm not going to listen to anybody. I've got to learn my way. Um, but then that's the only way that he can feel emotionally satisfied. So this is probably a restrictive name for him. He probably would be better off to be using Andrew at this point in time, because when using the name Andrew, while he needs to have a lot of physical space around him, isn't this interesting? This is because he would feel trapped in smaller environments. Um, this translates to he needs to have room to move and to be on his own as part of retaining his own mental health and well-being. And this might very well explain his resistance to move from his current property, if this is correct, as reports go. Now, in regard to his relationships as Andrew, he needs to be surrounded by people that are uninhibited. And this is because he does struggle with feelings and emotions. And he also represses aspects of his personality. So if he's around a lot of people who are also inhibiting themselves and repressing aspects of themselves, this would be deeply frustrating for him. Um, and this would be why he is attracted to these people that are unfiltered um, the Epsteins and the Maxwells and the Savills, their public face was that of the party people, wild, uninhibited and good fun to be with. His upbringing has no doubt also intruded on his capacity to identify the wolves in sheep's clothing. 
because he wouldn't have been exposed to them, to the societal underbelly, I believe, I seriously doubt that within his relationships or interactions with the Maxwells and the Epsteins that he would have asked questions such as, by the way, these ladies, you're not paying them on my behalf as gifts to me, are you? You know, are these ladies prostitutes? No, I believe that he was so arrogant he would have thought that everybody um, saw the idea of being alone with him in a bedroom as an absolute privilege. So anyway, what we're seeing within that context is a person that is guilty of a lack of discernment around their associations because they're either too self-absorbed, blatantly stupid or in denial. Let's have a look at what his birth chart says about him. So I'm going to try and be quick here and uh, push on through this because it's such a long video. So I just want to explain, remember, this is not the full version of his numerology. Um, there are arrows that are on the chart. I might touch on them in a little while. But anyway, flashing through, what we can gather from this birth chart is that Andrew has the gift of the gab and he's blessed with verbal expression and the advice is he should never use it for the purposes of manipulation. Now, if he was planning to manipulate the public uh, with his disastrous interview that backfired, well, that's what happens when you try to manipulate. Anyway, the other advice is to avoid being intolerant of people without the same verbal gift. So that says... Um, speaks to his arrogance, if you like, and his dismissiveness of other people. Now, he has the capacity to see the both sides of an argument um, or any difficulty, and this would have been really perfect gifts for him in his role as the trade envoy, especially if he was using the gifts to enhance humanitarian concerns. He would have been advised to develop his intuitive gifts and that he should um, allow outdoor activities to help sustain him and to maintain his internal harmony and the balance um, that is required to develop these intuitive gifts. Other points are home and family are very important to him. A, home a harmonious, I can't even speak, a harmonious home is like a sanctuary and it's where he feels safe. Now, he does enjoy domestic life, but this can be challenging for him because it's not necessarily emotionally rewarding for him. He would have been advised to develop his sense of empathy as it's not one of his inherent gifts and he doesn't understand the emotional reactions of others. All of this is through his birth chart. I'm not doing a psychic reading here. This is all based on the numbers. There is indicators that he's lost two people in his childhood that he deeply loved. Now, if they were not immediate family members, they were like family members and this memory, uh, memory has carried through. Uh, the people would have featured in his life in strong ways, perhaps an aunt or an uncle, but there would have been a very strong attachment. Now, interestingly, there is evidence in the numbers of his impatience towards people. Oh, hang on. Sorry, coughing and sneezing here. Okay, so there is suggestion in his numbers that there is an impatience towards people that he feels or believes they haven't educated themselves or informed themselves before making their decisions. I would say, mm, really, law of reflection, that one. Right, so he would be advised to spend some time improving his mental acuity by doing things like memory games as this will help his sense of self-confidence as well and also help him avoid becoming like the nutty professor and even mitigate some of the forgetfulness for him as he ages. Aquarians, they tend to um, overthink if you like. They, they have too much going on in their head a lot of the time. So that makes sense to me. I do believe, oh, one of the other ones here is there is an inference that the losses he is currently experiencing are karma related um, and they are designed to teach him that he must put practical effort into evolving himself and deliberately applying his energies to attain the wisdom to lead a more fulfilling life and to this end he needs to be very organized and practical in his approaches the missing arrow from the chart reinforces that this business of andrew having to learn it his own way and not being able to be told so he was really born with that and i actually i obviously typed this up before i started i have actually written down poor thing no wonder he's repeated patterns um this business of my way or no way is such a recurring theme in his chart that i even started to feel a bit sorry for him however the arrow infers that um additionally the other meaning of the arrow is that he would react quite badly to be giving new information or being told what to do um the guidance would be to learn to deal with his reactivity because if he doesn't, it just leads to more headaches and anxiety and potentially ear and eye problems. So the suggestion from the arrow for the best outcomes are that he should seek to find meaning and have a purpose and develop 
a really strong sense of compassion to all living things and to learn to express that in a part of him that he keeps repressed through art and writing and when we fail to learn the lessons the universe just gives us more learning opportunities so just another aside i suspect that based on the numbers i'm looking at that andrew is probably less aligned with christian values um, and is probably more agnostic agnostic but i doubt that he would admit this given the association of the royal family with the church so to end this little uh, summary for him, for Prince Andrew, on a positive note, and just in the unlikely event that Prince Andrew, one of his family members, is watching this, the advice for him is that he can rebuild his life, but he needs to get smarter, stop being arrogant, and start listening to advice, especially the guidance that comes through in his numerology. If he is seriously planning to give another interview or to try and clear his name in the public domain, this would be ill-advised. He would be best to listen to the Queen's advice of never complain and never explain. The public has already found him guilty of lying and hypocrisy, and I doubt that even a jury would fix that for him. However, what he should remember is the public public can be very forgiving um, because we know that people can change but for a person to have changed it needs to be seen through their actions that they have made the changes the public will want to see that Andrew is working humbly for humanitarian causes without a desire for recognition or attention you know if the media catches him that's different but if he's inviting the media that would be not acceptable he should avoid putting pressure on King Charles to reinstate him to his work duties because that will only alienate the king from the public once he has demonstrated his integrity, the forgiving public could potentially petition the king to have him reinstated, and I believe this is the best outcome for him. Of course, these are my opinions. So as you can see with the very little information that I've given you today, numerology can help us to identify our vulnerabilities, our strengths, help us to find our purpose in life and so much more. In fact, as parents, we can even access information on how to parent our children, which are our blessings in life and our gift to the world. Numerology supports reflection and rational processing of emotional information and assists to link the mind, body and spirit so that we can individually and collectively feel a greater sense of love and peace in our lives. Lives. So numerology provides us with insight for ourselves and for others and this helps us to achieve both individually and collectively our potential in life and our purpose. So holy mackerel, as I say, this has been a long one. At this point in time, I'd like to thank you for viewing. You can expect to see more co content going up so that you can work out your own numerology and that of your family with at least a modicum of accuracy. I must apologize for the delays in getting the content up. It's actually a lot more involved than I thought it was. The biggest problem is actually internet speed for me. It slows the process down and there's not much I can do about it except kick on. And um, it's just really hard to do quality assurance on the content as well with this slowness of the internet speed, which is due to being in Australia. Anyway, I am inviting you to share the content that I put up. Um, sharing information is the only way that we can all grow through healthy discussion. Please note, um, because in my experiences, there is always somebody that will do this. If you put your business links up on this channel as a means to exploit the subscribers, I will remove them right and if you are unpleasant i will remove your comments as well um that doesn't mean to say that i seek an echo chamber i look forward to healthy discussion we don't all have to agree but it does help if we're all respectful to each other and our differences um if you decide to share my content i would ask please that you do acknowledge me or the channel because i've put many years into developing and building upon my pool of information and it would be nice to have this effort recognized I want to make it clear that while I do advertise my website and I do offer services, my channel is for the provision of information only and I simply would not be able to cope with an inundation of requests for my time. So I do restrict and limit the amount of consultations I provide these days. If you also would like to shout me a coffee in recognition of the time I devote to making the content, um, I have a donation button on my website and all coffees are appreciated with great gratitude. Um, thank you very much Lee in advance I also invite people to leave comments and subscribe as previously said click the bell to be notified if you want to be informed when the other content goes up for numerology if this is a subject interesting to you because I'm working on a lot of stuff at the moment and I think you'll like it but for now thank you for viewing have a wonderful blessed day thanks for being part of my journey bye